Big Dan, that's the key word there. We welcome back Graham Agars onto the program. Graham, you picked it, Sabalenka and Novak. Yeah, and um, the Novak uh, pick, you know, was sort of brain dead at the start of the tournament because we weren't um, that aware of how bad his uh, injury was. In fact, in the press room before Novak came in, uh, well after midnight, uh, after his final, Goran Ivanisevic came in and he said that uh, having received the MRI after injuring that hamstring in Adelaide on his way to victory over uh, over Sebastian Corder, 97%, don't ask me where Goran gets the number, but 97% of players presented with that MRI, which had two tears in the hamstring, would have walked straight into the referee's office and said, sorry, I'm out of here, I can't play, I've got a serious injury. So Gorin and his team looked at Novak and said, you're not going to play, are you? And he goes, yeah, I'm going to play, which prompted someone to ask uh, Gorin, so how do you guys deal with uh, Novak? He said, he's crazy. He's crazy. He's getting crazy all the time. His brain (laughs) is from another place. Not like us. He doesn't think like us. You know, so he's explaining just how serious the injury was. And the fact of the matter is it was sufficient for 97% of players to pull out of the tournament and was a problem of major proportions all the way through to the fourth round. So he gets through the first week on one leg, which doesn't say a whole lot for the players that he had to no. face. But after that, um, they both admitted, because of this amazing array of treatment he had, I mean, they tried everything from sitting on bottle tops to you know, the latest latest technology to work on this thing. But they admitted that after the fourth round, it was OK. It wasn't 100%, but it was certainly good enough for him to play near his top level, which is exactly what he did. The other thing Ivan Isovic explained, uh, which makes sense when you look at the stats that show how hard uh, Djokovic was hitting the ball throughout the whole championship, is that Novak had decided, without really telling anybody, that he would just up the ante on his backhand and forehand ground shots and just hit him harder so he didn't have to run as much. Now, I don't know how many players have ever existed in the game of tennis that can just go up that level when they need to because they're playing on one leg. But this guy can. That's why he's got 22 grand slams and and he's still out there uh, hunting. He hasn't given up yet. He thinks he's got two to three years uh, of performing at the level he's currently at. Well, that was one of the questions I got. But before I ask you that... A uh, quick text has come in. Uh, I couldn't believe, says this text, what I was watching when I saw Sitsipas hitting it long all game long. Can you please ask Graham? Um, he needed the match to go for four or five sets to take advantage of his youth. Well done, Novak, but I thought that Sitsipas tactics were all wrong. What do you think about that? Well, part of the part of the problem on the Sitsipas side of the net, as it was for the young American that played Djokovic, uh, Tommy Paul, in, in the semi final is you can take a game plan in there, and Tommy Paul's game plan was to mix up the pace, hit a few drop shots, move Novak around. But he said, he didn't let me do that because he hits it so hard and so deep, all you're doing is trying to stay in points. Now, here's the problem with Tsitsipas. He knows that his one-handed backhand breaks down under pressure. Novak knows that as well. So when Novak wants a point, he just goes to the backhand for a while, and he eventually gets an error or he'll change direction, and as soon as Sitsipas sees a forehand, which is his weapon, he goes for it. Right. And because he's so desperate to make the point, he's hitting them along, he's hitting them into the net, he's spraying them all over the place. So what Novak did was he took Sitsipas out of his comfort zone, and once he's out of his comfort zone, he can't play his game. His, his game is to get on the forehand every possible shot by running around the backhand. Novak knew that, didn't let him run around the backhand, made him play multiple backhands in most points. And then, you know, he knew that uh, Sitsipas would feel the pressure and start making mistakes with his winning shot. And that's exactly how it turned out. So brilliant tactics from Novak. And that's obviously designed by the backroom staff as well, isn't it, Graham? Let's make that perfectly clear. I mean, as much as he knows and, and he'll know his opponent and things, but somebody sat outside, looked at all of this and worked this out as well, haven't they? Yeah, no, that, that, they know Novak's game. They know what his weapons are. I, I mean, the, the thing about Novak, you can just say that the man's made of rubber. He's super fast and you can't hit a ball past him. That's why he wins. Well, that's true. But there's there's two factors as why you can't hit a ball past him. One is he seems to get to every shot 
and returns it with interest. And the second is he keeps playing so deep that it's very hard for you to attack him when the ball's on your side of the net. So, you know, he's he's just got everything going for him. He's got a good serve, powerful when he needs it, but usually hits it at about 80%, goes for placement, not power. But when he needs to, he can crunch it at over 200K like all the rest of them. And, and his just sheer determination of getting every ball back with interest on it makes it a nightmare for the guy at the other side of the court. And that's why he's won 22 slams. And had he not done this um, COVID nonsense, as far as I'm concerned, could have easily won one or two more US Opens and last year's Australian Open. He could be at 25 already. Mm. But, you know, that's a self-inflicted injury that he's going to have to have to deal with. And, and you know, he's so determined now uh, over the vaccination status that, you know, if the US keep him out like they'd likely to for Miami and Indian Wells coming up next month and possibly May in uh, September next year for the US Open, he's just going to wear it and say, well, I'll go somewhere else and win. Since the past said that he's the greatest to ever hold a racket, this was Novak himself. You know, as Jordan used to say, you know, uh, people only remember the, the good times, but uh, I failed, I failed, I failed, and that's why I succeeded in the end. Yeah, people forget this as well because, you know, we go into these tournaments and, you know, I mean, and, you know, I'm guilty of this as well, uh, you know, at the start of the event, Graham, just thinking, oh, yeah, Novak, he's going to win. And I remember talking to you uh, last week about and saying, oh, Novak's playing the guy that's going to be remembered as the guy that lost to Novak. I mean, it's, it's, it's not been disrespectful, but I suppose it's just an acknowledgement of how dominant the guy is, and I just don't believe that anyone can come close to him. But having said that, I mean, you've got to sit back also as a lover of the sport and appreciate it and go, wow, I mean, we are witnessing greatness in front of our eyes here. Yeah, well, we, we were lucky, weren't we? we? We got Federer and Adal and Djokovic in a package. I mean, how often does that yeah. happen? Um, you know, you could spread them out over three decades, and it, it'd probably be better off for us but um we got the three of them and novak was the poor man you know he was number three in the big three and and had this nasty habit of running out of gas in matches and having you know he, he'd lose his focus and and wouldn't stay in points and get beaten in matches that he was dominating early on and and he went you know he went into this celiac diet and and worked on every single part of him as well as his game to become the dominant player in tennis and that and that's where he is now because you know we all know that Rafa um you know he's a he's a spare parts miracle really the way he's doing it and and he's doing it for one reason and that is Novak those two guys as uh, Goran Ivanisevic said in that interview that fantastic interview he did they're playing paddle ball uh, you know, 21, 22, 22, 23, 23, 24. And they're not going to stop as long as they can run. Now, Goran said, next time, you know, the Australian Open, he says, that's Novak's backyard. Okay, so he's expected to win there. He says, next slam is Nadal's backyard. And, and Goran said, I think if Nadal walks on court, he should win the tournament. So it's a huge, mm. <clears throat> excuse me, a huge challenge, huge challenge for Novak in Paris, but then you get Wimbledon and it flips around the other side and, and Novak's much more likely to win at Wimbledon than he is at the French and he's also more likely to win at the US Open. So the odds are sort of working in um, Novak's, uh, Novak's favour. We'll come back to him in a second because I want to obviously ask about, you know, what happens from here for the rest of the year, but let's turn our attention to the women's final, which was a much better actual match to watch and Sabalenka gets her first Grand Slam. How significant is that? And also the fact she had to battle to do it a sit down. Yeah, no, no, it means a lot. In fact, that that played four times those two kids, and it's gone three sets every time. So the final wasn't a surprise. Um, and it's great to to get Sabalenka across the line because remember about a year ago she was serving underhand, underarm serves because she would completely, completely lost the rhythm with her serve. Last one that did that was Kornikova many years ago. Remember, she had served 22 double faults in a match. Mm. The opponent could, the opponent could just sit at the change of end chair anytime, um, anytime Kornikova was serving. She won the game anyway because uh, Kornikova hit double faults. So anyway, Sabalenka's deep, deep, deep trouble. She says to her coach of many years, "Look, I know this is not your fault, but you know, if you want to go away, I would understand." Maybe, you know, and, and, and the coach is saying, look, 
I can't help you anymore. I, I don't know how we deal with this. You know, if you want to go and get another coach, go ahead. So she's in a terrible place. The rest of the game is okay, but if you can't serve it, you don't get to show it. So the 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 upshot is that Sabalenka said, no, you've been loyal to me, I'm loyal to you, we're going to work through this together. And most of it was in the head, and, and exactly how they achieved this, I don't know, because they're, they're not letting on. But somehow... They find they find a way for her to regain confidence in her serve, and now she's back on track and and proved it here at the Australian Open. If the serve's working, her game's fantastic, and she can win anywhere. She can play clay, she can play grass, she can play hard court. So the future is bright for her, as it is for Rybakina, who came of age at Wimbledon and showed us in Australia it wasn't a one-time wonder. She's got the game to be really, really effective. And those two kids, if they stay healthy and focused, are going to have a great uh, rivalry over the next few years, for sure, because they're playing big tennis, which is bad news for Svontek, the current number one, because she's not hard, as hard a hitter as those two girls and relies on placement. So she's going to have to work really hard. And the, and the one I'm really worried about is Coco Goff, who I desperately want to see really get to the top of tennis, because... She's she's a great player and she's a terrific kid and um, she's going to struggle with the power that Sabalenka and Reed Barkin are producing. So women's tennis at a really interesting stage going forward. Yeah, I, the one that concerns me the most, uh, Graham Agus is with us talking tennis, the Aussie Open, is uh, Rudder Canoe, who since the US Open and any Grand Slam can't, can't get past the second round and you just wonder. And also, you know, Naomi Osaka, who I just don't believe is ever going to come back to this level. But when you actually put those names there, you show Svontek and you've got Goff and the two that uh, contested the final. I mean, women's tennis is in a good place. Somehow they've just got to market these names and market these women now and forget about the Serena influence and actually move forward from her because, you know, the game does need stars. It needs personalities. And you've got plenty of great players there. Can they can they squeeze that side of the lemon out, Graham? Because it's not just about your on-court thing. They need a bit of off-court zazz as well. Yeah. First of all, you need a rivalry. I mean, Chris Everett, Martina Navratilova, you know, Steffi Graf, Martina Hingis. You need that sort of stuff because it drives headlines and, and, and it's exciting. So... Uh, the women desperately need, you know, say three, four, five players, and that, they've got them in there that, that are competitive uh, every tournament and definitely every major, you know, which makes it really exciting. And hopefully that will happen. Going back to Raducanu, I think she has the same problem as golf at the moment, struggles against power. And, you know, when she meets that, she's not quite ready to deal with it. So both of those players are going to have to get stronger. And as far as Serena Williams is concerned, if you looked at the average speed of serve and um, backhand forehand in rallies, both Rybakina and Sabalenka were hitting the ball harder on average than Serena did. They've taken Serena's power game, they've taken it up a notch, and they do it with the drama of Serena. They just quietly go about smashing winners. Um, so, you know, that to me is also exciting. They're, playing, they're just playing great tennis, and that final proved it. I mean, that, that, you have to work hard. You have to do everything right to win that match, and, and Sabalenka did it. And once she's got this breakthrough win, having failed on three occasions before in Grand Slam semifinals to make it to the big, the big show, uh, she now believes. And, and once she believes and you see the power that she's got in the game, you know, she, she's she got a great future. As long as she stays fit and focused, you've got to say that about all tennis players now because having a game is, is you know, not enough. All right, a couple of quick questions. We'll let you go then. Uh, I'm always, I, I'm, you know, I'm, maybe it's just me, but whenever I, I see Goran Ivanisovic, I love this guy. I just, I go back to that crazy Wimbledon final over and what the semi-final against Tim Henman over about three days and the fact he was a wild card and he won that. Plus also, is it significant at all that you have got a, a, a Croat man and a Serbian man working side by side? I don't know if anyone from those countries has ever been great friends ever, especially since 90, the early 1990s. And I'm not being a smarty pants about this, but the fact that, you know, is it sport? Tennis can bring two people together, two countries that we're told hate each other and the people despise each other. You've got two people here that are side by side working at the very highest level under, under stress and pressure. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, sport does do that. Sport, sport breaks down rivalries, there's no doubt about it. And, and you know, Goran and, and Novak are tight. And, and uh, Goran said, 
you know, another question with Gordon Boyle, I, I wish I'd recorded all of that press conference. I could have sent it everywhere. But, um, you know, somebody was saying, you know, he gives you awful grief when you're in the box. Yeah, you know, and Gordon goes, I, I was a tennis player too, and I was kind of crazy myself. You know, <laughs> he said, you have to explode every now and then. He said, if he wants to explode at me to get the tension out in a match, it's okay. It's okay. He can do whatever he wants to do if he needs to get the pressure out. But he better win. He better win. <laughs> because Brilliant. if he starts beating, Gorin's not going to put up with it. So you can see those two guys, they bonded, you know, and, and they both have amazing respect. Gorin only won the one Grand Slam, but he could have won many, many yeah, more if yeah. he could have got his head, you know, got his head right. But that was Gorin. Uh, and, and as I said, the funniest interview in tennis. I just love watching him. But in, in being funny on, uh, on his, in his interviews, he's also giving you all of this information you know, that just pours out of them that you don't normally get from players. So great friends, and, and it's, you know, it just shows the world you can do it. You just have have to have common common uh, things between you, and you can overcome just about anything. Graham, thank you so much for that, as always. Fantastic talking to you. I love it. The best insight we ever get about the Grand Slams and the Majors is from that guy, Graham Agar.